as the sun went down, they started bringing the pigs in and they were just crying for their lives. And, um, and I just grabbed a piece of paper and pen and just started pouring words and lyrics out from the perspective of the pigs I was seeing out the window. I will not stop fighting for them till the day I die. And they are the reason I get up in the morning and they're the reason I do everything I do. So yeah, they just need so much help and they need every single one of our voices. So just don't forget that. Amazing. Katie, welcome. Thanks for joining me. How are you doing? Absolute pleasure to be here, Louis. Thank you. No worries. So you we were talking just uh, before we started recording now about taking on lots of different things and you've got such an interesting background. I want to start with biodynamic avocado farming. Mm -hmm. Super interesting. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, well, look, I was I was lucky enough to grow up in rural Western Australia and Western Australia, especially South Western Australia, is a great place for growing avocados. Um, and when I was 21, I was fortunate enough to be in a position um, to be able to obtain a farm with my then partner. And, um, you know, it's very rural. It's five hours south of Perth, which is the most isolated city in the world. Wow. So, um, <laughs> but a beautiful place, like stunningly beautiful and really fertile soil. Pretty cold for Australia standards, probably not for you. But, um, yeah, you know, uh, anyway, a unique experience. However, I did grow up there originally, so I'd, it, I'd come back to sort of settle down and um, start farming, which was something I was so passionate about um, because I was so into biodynamics and permaculture and organics and sustainable food and just really aware of how damaging conventional food can be for both our bodies and the planet. So extremely fortunate to be in a position to do that um, at the time. Um, but, you know, everything has two sides and it was very challenging and also very isolating. I was so young. Um, sure. And I wasn't, I wasn't actually really ready to become a farmer, but it was too good an opportunity to not do. Um, and I'd been in the music industry really intensely in Australia for the years before that. And I was a bit kind of, I needed a break. I was over it. Like I was over all the touring and the pressure. And um, so it seemed really appealing at the time. But yeah, it, it was a good journey, but it's also nice to be on the other side of it as well. But whilst I was there, it was about five years, um, and I didn't just grow avocados, although that was the main commercial crop. I also uh, rescued 300 chickens at a time. I had rescued cows and sheep, and I also grew um, all of our fruit and veg. Amazing. And what a way to, to connect to food. I think it's a lot of the problem we have, um, well, globally, is that people are so disconnected from where food grows and indeed how it grows. Many children that will go to a supermarket and be completely unaware of the journey that food has, go on, has, has been on. I just wanted to touch on one, one point you mentioned there about biodynamics. Mm -hmm. for, the, for those of you who don't know what biodynamic farming is or how it differs, can you speak a little bit about kind of what biodynamic means? Sure. So to be certified biodynamic properly, it's an extensive process and costs a lot of money as well. So you have to pay for all the testing and all the audits, which we did. Um, and basically the difference between being certified biodynamic or certified organic is that if you're biodynamic, you don't actually buy in um, organic fertilizer. You make what's called biodynamic preps on the property or you can buy them, but they're from special biodynamic people. It's very sort of like in the club. Um, and those preps, which, um, yeah, they're, they're kind of like fertilizer, but they are much more aesthetic. Um, as in, them, it's actually quite spiritual, and to be honest, it's why we did end up moving away from biodynamics towards the end because it, it, it is based on the e, uh, you know, the, the planets, planetary systems. Um, about it's based upon like energies and um, and things that are quite intangible. Um, however, it has been quite effective and has seemed to work yeah. somehow. So, you know, some things make a little bit of sense. Um, other things don't make any sense. Um, but you know what, it was, it was an interesting journey and at least it's organic. So it's organic and more, but with organic, you can buy in organic fertilizers and you can do a lot more things. It's a lot more free, but with organics, you can still feed the plant directly. Um, for example, NPK, the most common nutrients, you can feed them directly in an organic way, but you're still not actually getting the plant to integrate with the soil in the same way that it would in a, say, a forest where the, the whole system between soil and plant is initiated and facilitated by bacteria and fungi. And, and that's the big difference. That's in biodynamics. 
we, we want to make that soil so alive that those transitions can happen between the plant and the soil. Whereas organic, you can still just feed the plant directly and kind of skip that process. I spoke to a um, uh, friend, Dr. Vincent Walsh. He was on this podcast previously, and he talked about these na- natural systems. And nature's done, <clears throat> excuse me, billions of years of R and D to create these systems in which these plants can flourish. Mm-hmm. And we've kind of come along and said, no, we know better. We're going to monocrop this area. We're going to grow one crop and have to feed it this to get rid of this to get rid of this. But nature's already done a lot of the work, right? A lot of the, that work's already kind of been proven as to as to, as to how it works. I think it's, um, it's totally. absolutely fascinating. So from growing food to cooking food. So you're mm-hmm. obviously, you know, um, today, currently, one of your things that you work on is that you're a, a plant-based chef. What was that kind of transition like? Um, it was pretty radical because um, I went from, you know, having the farm uh, to moving to London and studying in Holborn, you know, zone one next to Oxford Street. Um, Quite prestigious space, right? Quite prestigious. Uh... Yes, it is very prestigious. And that was really appealing to me because, you know, I never finished school. I became a professional musician very young when I was 15. So, um I'd never actually had a piece of paper to my name. <laughs> and so it did feel really appealing to, you know, be a qualified plant-based chef. And not only that, but a Le Cordon Bleu qualified, which is literally the only uh, place in the whole world where you can obtain a proper culinary arts diploma in plant-based arts. So it means that I'm one wow. of only 50 odd people that have that. And that uniqueness um, and sort of quality was really appealing. Yeah, amazing. So where did you, um, after pursuing that qualification, what was the, I guess, the, the thought process behind that? Was your intention to uh, to become a chef, to work in restaurants? Like, how were you thinking about how that might progress from there? Yeah, look, to be honest, I was never particularly keen to work full-time in restaurants because at that point I was already a published author. I already had a decent Instagram following and, um, and so many other passions and skills that I wanted to pursue and when you are a working chef you are a working chef pretty much full stop and um and you know because I'd been a professional performer and singer for so many years it would have felt quite a hard transition to then suddenly be in a basement with fluoro lights for 12 hours being yelled at potentially when I'd worked for myself and been on stage you know for 10 years plus beforehand so it wasn't really about that. However, it was it was more about being you know being legit, being recognised, and um, being and learning. Obviously, like like really upping my skills and being able to then you know be certified to share that with others through cooking classes, more books, consulting, um, and all of the above. I think yeah, I think that's that's such a great point because there's many creators out there who perhaps they've you know they're either self-taught or they've you know, they've done a little bit of training and they become content creators with a big following and can sometimes feel like they're not necessarily have the, the, the validity there to go with that, that kind of that, um, that position that they've, they've, they've got for themselves. So it makes a lot of sense why you choose to do that. And obviously you've mm-hmm. done a lot with uh, food photography as well and you've had mm-hmm. cookbooks, etc. So can you talk a little bit about how the kind of the, the cookbooks came to be, how you incorporated the photography side of it because again, there's a lot of creativity there I'm seeing right from from yeah. uh, being a musician and then in terms of thinking about food as as, as a form of art how did the uh, how did the cookbooks uh, come to be yeah thanks for recognizing that I do feel like you know my ultimate purpose on this planet is to be an artist in one way or another so as long as I'm being creative I'm much more sane you know when I was 18 I started studying nutrition um, wanting to help people eat but, you know, back then it wasn't strictly vegan. I was vegetarian at the time, but at least just to help you eat more healthy food. Um, and I quite quickly realized that that scientific path just wasn't for me. As much as I wanted it to be, I wanted to remember all the facts and be able to share that with people. But it's, if I'm not being creative, it's just not my path. It's just not my strength. So really happy to have been able to find this new path as an author, food photographer, food stylist, and all the things that we've mentioned um, as my one of my new best creative paths. So um, the cookbook was one of the first pipe dreams that came about when I started doing this, um, obviously as a great tool to spread my message and inspire people to be vegan. And I really felt that I had a quite unique perspective having come from the farm and shooting the food in a really beautiful, rustic, um, you know, farmhouse aesthetic. It's something that I feel, I don't think many other vegan uh, chefs 
or authors have done and I really hope that that's recognised much further than it has been so far that that's a really unique uh, style and look to bring and it can be it's really important because not everyone wants to eat really clean food in a really modern environment you know we want some people want that more warm gourmet kind of comforting just it's just a different angle that I'm bringing I hope I think I think it makes a lot of sense you know to your point around the connection between where food comes from I've I've worked in hospitality for years and Mm. worked with chefs who know very little about the food they're cooking beyond how to prepare it and make it taste great know very little about how it grows where it grows where it comes from the nutritional uh, side of the food but it's, it's, there's a disconnect there. So I think bringing that kind of full circle is important. I can certainly relate to what you said about, you know, the nutrition side of things. I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, great at studying or sitting in a, in a, in a lecture hall and learning. It's more yeah. the creative side of it and make it and building connections in that way. So I think to your point on self-awareness, it's just so important to, to make the biggest impact you can. There's a degree of self-awareness that's necessary to understand, okay, this is what I'm great at. This is what I thrive at. Perhaps Mm -hmm. this is my unique experience. And knowing myself and understanding what I'm uniquely good at and the experiences that I've had, I can create this path. And this is kind of the path that I'm going to take. And that's evident with the, obviously, the cookbooks that that, that you've worked on and the path you've been on so far. And full circle, I guess, to now with music and, and, and the work that you're doing there, which is which is super fascinating. So I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about um, the, yeah, the, the music 2.0 for you, perhaps. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, it is extremely unique what I've done with the Songs for the Animals project. Um, and for those that haven't heard of them, there's four songs that I've written that are completely vegan songs. One of them, the title track, all the same, is about our misconnection and sort of how damaged our relationship with animals is as a whole. But the three other tracks, which are less well known, but I find almost more powerful personally, are in a first perspective. And that has, I don't think, ever been done before, and it is so powerful. So one of them is uh, called Hoping, and it's written in the first perspective from a mother dairy cow whose baby is taken away from her, of course. The other one is Brumby, and it's written from the perspective of a mare who is bred into the racing industry. And in Australia, wild horses are called Brumbies, and it's this mare's. Um, I'm getting emotional. Talk, like they're just they're so, they're from such an emotional deep place, and me even talking about them is is challenging. Let alone singing them, but um, you know, luckily they're recorded, so they're they're there to listen to. But um, you know, she is just stuck in the system and just wants to be free like a Brumby. And then the fourth one, which is probably my favourite, is called 106, and it's in first perspective from a peak, a little peak in the industry, and how she or he just wants to be with their family and free and expressing themselves, and it's just so, so sad to listen to. And I really think that it's some of the most powerful activism I've heard, and I know that sounds terrible because it's my own work, but honestly, it is just so cutting and it's so unique because you've got the power of melody. We all know how powerful music can be. I mean, we've all cried to some moving song at some point. And then it's got the facts in the lyrics. It's first person, but it's based on absolute reality. You know, it's written from my research as a vegan, just knowing what those scenes are like from watching the slaughterhouse footage, from watching the farming footage, from actually being in some of those farms myself. Um, and growing up in the country where you're literally exposed to dairy cows. I've been into dairies. I've actually milked cows myself as a child. You know, I've actually seen it firsthand. And so, yeah, I mean, I really think there is so much more potential for these songs to be used by our movement. I wrote them as a gift to the movement and to the animals. They should be used by major platforms to get this message across and, and kind of break open people's hearts in a way that hasn't been done before because it is combining mediums. And to take that even further, for two of the tracks, I made professional level film clips to go with them. So we've now got the power of melody, fact, and visual and not just still visual but actual video with these actual animals and those life's actual situations right in front of us so hugely powerful and if anyone's listening and wants to use them and listen to them please please do and spread the love yeah the production is is, is absolutely incredible so I, I definitely advise people to go and check them out why why do you feel and, and, and this is a common question that i ask and i don't think there's a definitive answer and it's such a nuanced question but 
from your perspective, why do you feel there's such a disconnect for people? You know, we have our our pets, our cats and our dogs, and it's, it's evident for anyone that's had a pet that they are highly intelligent, emotional, mm-hmm. and have capacity for all a huge range of emotion from, you know, sadness, anger, um, content, happiness, everything. Why do you think it's, um, it's, it's so challenging for people to uh, empathize with the, the plight of animals? I definitely think it's taught behavior. And I think that that's really evident if you speak to really young children who don't know, and if you actually told them what happens, they'd be distraught. It's mm. so evident that our natural um, nature is to be compassionate and loving, obviously, hence, you know, slaughterhouses having to be out, whoop, whoop out the back, um, and obviously ag gag laws becoming more and more strong. We, they cannot let that be seen because obviously we're naturally so compassionate. Um, and I think that it just speaks immense volumes to reflect on our natural state. I mean, if we were meant to eat meat, we wouldn't have those feelings. I mean, my dog, <laughs> I can tell you right now, does not have those feelings. He will he'll hunt a kangaroo if he's given the chance. He has, sadly. Mm. You know, he is a dog. He's a carnivore. And we are not. You know, it shouldn't. if we were meant to eat meat, we wouldn't be mortified at those th- sites. It would be quite natural because we, we would know deep, deep down, or even at least on a subconscious level, that that's necessary, but it's completely not. And so the proof is really evident to me. But of course, to make money, the industry has to combat that in such a strong way. And that's why the conditioning and the marketing is just so intense from day one, from schools. Um, And it's also important to look at the history books. You know, Earthling Ed, who is an absolute hero of mine, um, spoke about a study where um, the reason we have dairy industry is because in World War, I think, one, um, we needed cannibal food for soldiers quickly so the few people in the UK that had house cows which would have been only quite wealthy people suddenly had an incentive to increase their herd and make condensed milk to send to soldiers and then when the war died there was this excess of milk so what do they do they came up with a market it let's just pull something out of thin air and say it's good for bones because it's white and it sort of makes sense and bam we have the dairy industry and everyone thinks it's necessary it was literally born of a waste product I mean that is just insane but to understand that sort of history helps, I think, I hope, us to go, oh, hang on a sec, that's not necessarily true. Um, but yeah, the conditioning is so intense and it's a lot of, it's a lot to get through. I think, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And if you look back, the, the conditioning has been consistent throughout childhood and perhaps is inconsistent with our, our, our um, natural moral position. Mm-hmm. What do you think, um, what do you think of the current kind of I guess, attack on the plant-based movement because what, what I've seen in the last two, two, two years and, and certainly it's been ramping up recently is that almost like Big Ag have got together and said, we need to put a stop to this because if you look at the, the rate of adoption when it comes to plant-based milk, overtaking dairy milk, there's a huge trajectory and it's on course to pretty much eradicate the dairy dairy market. Um, plant-based meat, although it's, you know, in the press, it would seem like it's kind of stagnated in, in many respects, is it's definitely the consumption of alternative proteins is on the rise. Mm. How do you see this, this, this playing out? Because, you know, from my perspective, every day at the moment, there's an article in the press about how vegans are weak, you're malnourished, you know, you, um, these, these alternative products are bad for you, um, you know, how regenerative farming needs animals. Um, how do you, how do you res- how do you respond res- respond to that? Yeah, um, well, look, it's really challenging. Um, there's not a huge amount of getting around that. All I can say to that is that it comes down to responsibility of each one of us vegans to look our best. You know, like try, please try to be a healthy, vibrant, fit version of yourself. Because if if we can you know, actions do speak louder than words and everyone who knows us that sees us thriving is going to go, hmm, even subconsciously, even if they don't admit it, they will on some level think, hmm, Lily looks pretty damn fit actually, hmm, hmm, you see him, okay, you know, they won't admit it, but it'll, we, we can speak with, with our own bodies and that's one of the most powerful ways. Um, and look, I don't know how we're going to overcome the press, I just, I just hope that we all we keep voting with our wallets um will eventually the tables will turn i think the the absolute key is for governments to shift the subsidies from animal ag to plant-based ag i mean at the moment the beyond burgers are still i think it was i think it, oh, i can't remember if it's in pounds and i convert to dollars but you know 
it's still a lot. And, you know, it really kills me that animal products are all so stupidly subsidised that we think that it's cheap, but it is not. And that will be when the biggest shift comes is when those subsidies are shifted. And I'm not sure what that will take other than just voting with our wallets every day and, and spreading the message as well as we can. <coughs> But let's hope it's soon. Yeah, for sure. No, I completely agree. I think it has to there has to be changes at a legislative level to enable, you know, these these products to to to, to be on a on any on a level playing field, quite frankly, right? We need to if you've got consumers have not only got transparency on um, the true cost and have a have a choice, um, they're gonna make the right I've got faith that people will make the right decision and that's coupled with the information being out there. I think the Another really impactful, I think it's absolutely true what you said, you know, we, sh- we should see ourselves as almost like a walking advertisement for the, for the, um, for the movement that we're, we're, that we're pushing, and I, I, I certainly do. But I think it's also about finding your art. I think that's very, you know, that, that's kind of your journey so far as I see it. It's finding your art and using art as a way to communicate to people. And whether that's through food, whether that's food in the form of food photography and recipes, whether that's music, I think art is so powerful in conveying important messages and has been throughout history. If you look at all the great artists through history that have had such strong messages and it's such a strong way to, 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 to put across these, these points. What, um, where does the inspiration come from when it comes to, to music? You spoke about you've been, you know, been witness to some of these, uh, some of these farms and some of the, some of the, the, the situations these animals have been in. But yeah, where do you draw the, the inspiration from? Well, the the song 106 about the pigs was the first vegan song that I wrote and that inspiration was a very real life situation which was probably the moment I really went vegan which is when I was on tour around Australia um, and the two of us broke down outside South Australia's largest pork abattoir coincidentally <laughs> which was just so ironic I couldn't have you know I couldn't have made it happen it just happened and I I feel as horrendous as it was very fortunate because that was the turning point so um, I was stuck on the side of the road the RAC which is something similar to you have in Britain uh, they couldn't come till the next morning because it's very rural and we were stuck on the side of the road and as you probably know a pig's circadian rhythm is the same as a human's and therefore it's easier to transport them at night when they're a bit sleepy and as the sun went down, they started bringing the pigs in and they were just crying for their lives. And, um, and I just grabbed a piece of pen and a piece, piece of paper and pen and just started pouring words and lyrics out from the perspective of the pigs I was seeing out the window. Um, and that was the inspiration for 106. And I refined that, you know, pages and pages of, of their story into that song. So, the inspiration for that song was very much an, a real life experience, a life changing experience. Um, the other ones, yeah, I guess it's just from feeling their pain so immensely. I mean, um, I think, yeah, just watching, you know, I, as a vegan, we all kind of know what goes on and just tapping into those feelings and then being able to put them into lyrics and into melody. I remember the, the night that I wrote, um, Brumby and one o and uh, hoping I was actually just jamming like normal music for a gig or something rehearsing, and I was home alone and I remember just suddenly starting to just sort of jam with myself, and the lyrics just started pouring through me. And I quickly grabbed my phone and just pressed record and just kept going, and it was literally like a borderline spiritual experience where those songs just. I didn't even, it wasn't even fully conscious. I was just playing the guitar and they just, those stories just came through pretty directly. Like there was not much trimming of the fat in those lyrics. It was just like, boom, there they were recorded. And it was like, I have to do something with these songs. I have to record them. I have to film them. I have to tell this story. Um, so that's how those those four songs came about. Two, two really actionable points there, I think, for people. The first is to go out and have experiences. Because ultimately, it's through lived experience that we come up with solutions to problems, inspiration to things based on what we see, what we go through. I think to go out and have experiences, is, and it sounds very kind of vague, but to your point, you know, you're out touring, you get stopped. But you, it, you couldn't have chosen that to happen. It only happened because you were out and about. Mm-hmm. Secondly, is to, and, and I can certainly relate to what you said about feeling like something's working through you. 
But in order to create space for that to happen, you have to create the the the, the scenario. And in 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 just jamming, that's a form of meditation, right? You are you are not thinking about the weather or the yeah. mortgage payment or what's happening next week. You're yeah. creating space to to have a kind of uh, an empty, still mind. Mm. And that's when I find that you get lots of inspiration and ideas come through and you can allow yourself to be quiet, which is, you know, really challenging in our culture because we're told that yeah. we need to be busy and productive from the minute we wake up to the minute we go to bed. And if we're not busy and productive, we should watch or listen or do something that distracts us. Yeah. I think creating those spaces where we have, you know, the ability to be still and to not be thinking or doing and allow stuff to come through is when we can get a lot of inspiration and on the point of inspiration we've said already you know that you've done lots of different things which is which is really you know help to, to have this creative spark different experiences different you know different different um different roles etc how do you balance it and we spoke about this off, offline a little bit it's you know for someone that many of us do lots of different things right we see ourselves wearing different hats we have our hat perhaps as a parent as a as a as as our job, as our hobby, as our passion project, and very often these things can seem like they're inconsistent, or there's you know there's there's different we're viewed in different ways. How do you tackle um, you know being seen as different things? At the moment, you are a musician, you are uh, a chef, you are a food photographer. You know how how do you think about those uh, those those different roles that you play? Yeah, I mean, it is something I. I don't want to say struggle with it, it's a bit strong, but I do sometimes feel a bit scattered, like how do I focus this message? Um, and it's something I'm working on at the moment, actually, so I might have some more answers for you in a couple of weeks. Um, but, yeah, um, I don't know. I really actually don't know, to be honest. <laughs> I'm going to be really honest. I don't really have a good answer for that one. Um, I just I just hope that more and more people you know, tune into my work in different ways that resonate with them, um, whether they find one of the songs of animals on YouTube and then find my food work or they're a fan of my food or they have my book and then they find my songs. Um, but, you know, it is a bit challenging because they are different in the terms of um, the songs of animals are, are pretty hardcore vegan. You know, they are cuttingly vegan. <laughs> and whereas the food, I try to be much more approachable to anyone. I, I try to make the food as accessible to everyone as possible, really on purpose. I try to make it the kind of food that a baby, not a baby, but a toddler would want to eat, a grandma yeah. would want to eat, and everyone in between, whether they're vegan or not. And I really do actually think I've achieved that. I think all the every single recipe in the book is food that everybody would love, would never in a million years could guess was vegan. You know, it's not typical vegan food. It is not acai bowls and smoothies and salads. There's no salad in the entire book <laughs> on purpose because I don't want to eat salad. I live in a cold climate. Like, I know I'm Australian, it's hard to believe, but I do. And, you know, so do most people in England. Like, we don't want to eat tropical health food all the time. So... I try to make the book really accessible to everyone, whereas my music work is is quite vegan, and so that's a challenge is sort of who to, who to target market for those two sort of platforms. Um, but yeah, that's part of it. That's let's let's talk a bit about that. I think there's I think what it does beautifully is it offers people different people different routes in, right? And there's a message with with the music that will resonate with one group of people. And the food will resonate with groups of people. Some people will like, resonate with food through learning how to cook it. Other people resonate with food visually and how they see it. Yeah. Um, so I think what you're offering is, is through art and through creativity is different way, different points of access to what is essentially the same message. And that's the common thread through, through, mm -hmm. through all that you do. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, keep, keep, uh, keep doing what you're doing in that respect. I think it always kind of, we get to find our voice through doing, right? We get to find out how we best get our message across by trying lots of different things. And that's kind of my message for, for anyone that has a strong belief around sustainability, around wellness, around food and really cares about it. It's mm. find ways to communicate, find ways that, that, that resonate with you, find your art, find find what feels good, put it out, test, refine. We, we get better by doing, not by, by sitting back and, and trying to make it perfect. I think that's really... Really, really yeah. important because there's, we, we, we all have an interesting perspective. 
Hundred percent, Louis, and you are a fantastic example of just that. So, also thank you for your broad gifts to the world as well. Um, and I really like the way you mentioned in there um, the non-perfection part. I am, I, I'm not really well. Sometimes a perfectionist, but I'm more of a just let's just give it a, a crack, you know, like. Exactly. Um, and I think that probably has been a beneficial trait to not hold back and just to just get it out there. Like it's better than nothing, right? Um, for so, sure. For people listening that are maybe sat on an idea or something they really want to do, you know, you're you're a great example of someone that's literally taken action. I want to I want to make I want to make a book. Go and make a book. I want to study to be a chef. Go and study at a super high level. I want to record music and put it out. You've done it. And for for many people, I think you know we've got a lot of there's a lot of motivation. There's a lot of you know desire to put something out there and just can't quite bring themselves to do it. What would you say to those people? How do you kind of think about going ahead and, and taking action like that? Yeah, um, I would say that, you know, it. Um, I guess I'm hesitant to say just do it to a certain extent because we, we also want to keep the, the quality level of what we're putting out as a movement fairly sure. high. Um, sure. I, I hope that doesn't sound wrong, but I think it is really important that we're putting out factual stuff and quite high quality stuff. I mean, unfortunately, I have heard some people say that some things in the vegan movement are quite tacky um, and I think it's really important that we keep that bar really high whatever the art form and whatever the science we're talking about and let's keep it really legit um, however um, equally it's super important even for yourself to um, express this stuff and and connect with others and stuff like that so I mean I don't know I don't, it depends on the person and, and, and what they're intending to do, but definitely you can do it if you've got enough courage and enough passion and uh, there's certainly enough motive if you just tune into the animals and think about what they're going through. If you're ever stuck for for incentive to get up and do it, bloody hell, just think of, think of the animals. I mean, that is literally what keeps me going. I mean, I have been doing this full-time for over three years now, and yes, I'm published, I have done okay, but you know, I, I certainly don't have hundreds of thousands of followers, which is extremely painfully frustrating considering how much work I've put in. And I could I could easily quit. I've had moments of thinking, this is not working, I, you know, I don't make any money. It's amazing. People would probably look at me and go, oh my God, I don't make, I still have to do gigs back in Australia to actually pay my bills. Um, so it's certainly not for money. It's you know, it, it would be nice to be recognised, but it is number one for the animals. And that, I like, I, it's just so emotional for me. I will not stop fighting for them till the day I die. And they are the reason I get up in the morning, and they're the reason I do everything I do. So, yeah, they just need so much help, and they need every single one of our voices. So just don't forget that. I think you answered it so beautifully. It was, it's really about connecting with your reason for doing it. And that is a powerful force that when things become challenging and, you know, it gets hard as invariably working for yourself or any kind of creative pursuit or any business is incredibly hard. It's a huge weight of responsibility, sometimes for you and for others mm -hmm. and for those that depend on you and those that are around you. So I think having a, you know, point number one is having a strong sense of purpose and an ability to reconnect to the reason why you're doing it in the first place. And for many for people that will be different, even within the plant-based movement or vegan movement, that may, it may be the animals for some, it may be health for others, it may be sustainability for others, but having a strong connection to that purpose, I think is hugely important. I think self-awareness is also incredibly important. Like, what am I good at? You know, if I'm, if you're maybe not great with science and, and ac academia maybe it's not publishing papers maybe you're 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 great you're a great chef you're a great photographer maybe it's that so it's self-awareness to understand where you can put stuff out and i think thirdly absolutely right there is there is um the, the standard needs to be high and therefore it's about investing time into your craft and really learning i think one of the problems that we have in our culture is this kind of fast now reward system we want everything now you want to be validated now it's like no actually go and study mm. spend the time invest the time go and learn go and be an apprentice go and mm. really hone your craft and this is a way of taking action you know if you're if you're on a job that you don't particularly enjoy you've got massive passion for, for for sustainability and you want to learn 
how to resolve some of the biggest issues. And we've got a ton of problems in all of these spaces that can be solved, by the way. So there's plenty of opportunity for that. Go and take the time to study and learn about it before you put something out there. Make sure you know, you know, learn. I think there's so there's there's so many problems that can be solved and we need people that are passionate but equally backed up with, with some learning and understanding um, and that ensures that we have a, a good quality of, 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 of art of, of business of whatever that might be out mm-hmm. in the world to move things forward and ultimately I believe the truth prevails and what we're doing is truthful it's honest and yeah. I think ultimately that 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 will that will win over in the end um, tell me just to, to finish tell me a little bit about kind of current projects future projects what you're excited about what's coming up and how we can now uh, we can spread the message. Thanks for um, yeah asking. Well, um, I am a big dreamer, as you may have realised already. So, yeah, I have some pretty big plans. But um, I'm just about to turn thirty, so I think it's a good time for you know getting serious about the business plan mm-hmm. um, and moving forward in the smartest way possible. And I definitely want to write another book um, in the process of getting a more international publisher. So hopefully one here in the UK. Um, and I also really want to get my TV show on air. I did um, get pretty far with that in Australia a couple of years ago. It was contracted to Channel 10, which is one of our live to air, uh, free to air, sorry, I should say, um, channels. It wasn't, um, we didn't get enough funding behind it, which is, you know, challenging for a plant based show because not many brands um, want to get behind that, and the vegan ones aren't necessarily the biggest budget ones. But I did make some pretty serious inroads with that and I am determined to get that on television because I need to combine my performance career with my vegan career and obviously TV is a very good way to combine the two. So, yeah, very determined to do that. So book, TV, um, I'd really like to start a brand in Australia um, that can be international. I really want to start an app that's also in development stage with a developer in Australia to make an app that obviously there's a lot of vegan apps and that's fantastic but one that's a bit more on brand to myself, which is more low waste and seasonal. And so helping people when they've got, you know, a broccoli in the fridge that they've had for three days and they don't know what to do with it, they can search broccoli and heaps of broccoli recipes are going to come up. It's going to help them make um, succinct shopping lists. It's going to help them eat in season, help them recycle food. Um, So just a bit more of an eco, but really resourceful vegan food app. So that's in the pipeline as well. Um, And... When I go back to Australia, I'd like to buy another property. It won't be a farm again, but it'll be something where I can have a vegan um, sort of hospitality space and definitely run my cooking classes on a more regular basis. So I I love teaching, and I think it's one of the best ways to give people the opportunity to feel empowered in the kitchen to cook vegan food. And they often just need that little bit of help or to, in real life, ask those questions and be shown. And mm. I get to see people have those light bulb moments. So that, that is super special and I want to do lots more of that. So, um, yeah, it's going to be a busy next 10 years, but I'm totally keen to achieve everything I just said. Um, so stay tuned. <laughs> Amazing. And to stay connected, where can people where can people find you? So I would love, first and foremost, for them to please follow me on my Instagram page, which if you just type in Katie White, or if not by Katie White, as in this book is by Katie White, and there you'll find my work and also a link tree to my website. Um, you can also go on YouTube and find my songs for the animals and also my some of my cooking videos. Um, also, if you uh, YouTube... Katie White, um, or my previous sort of umbrella business name, which is Olive Wood Vegan. You can find them there as well. Um, and yeah, that would be the main things I'd say. So yeah, do check out my songs, the animals and my Instagram. And I hope you get to check out some recipes. There's lots of reels and I hope you find them really resourceful and inspiring. Yeah, I would definitely recommend people to do that. There's some amazing value to be had from those. So thank you for uh, sharing. Thank you so much for your time. Absolute pleasure. And thank you for your work too, Louis. Thank you.